英語聞き流しリスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com 4. Lottie. If Sarah had been a different kind of child, the life she led at Miss Minchin's select seminary for the next few years would not have been at all good for her. She was treated more as if she were a distinguished guest at the establishment than as if she were a mere little girl. If she had been a self opinionated, domineering child, she might have become disagreeable enough to be unbearable through being so much indulged and flattered. If she had been an indolent child, she would have learned nothing. Privately, Miss Minchin disliked her. But she was far too worldly a woman to do or say anything which might make such a desirable pupil wish to leave her school. She knew quite well that if Sarah wrote to her papa to tell him she was uncomfortable or unhappy, Captain Crewe would remove her at once. Miss Minchin's opinion was that if a child were continually praised and never forbidden to do what she liked, she would be sure to be fond of the place where she was so treated. Accordingly, Sarah was praised for her quickness at her lessons, for her good manners, for her amiability to her fellow pupils. For her generosity, if she gave sixpence to a beggar out of her full little purse, the simplest thing she did was treated as if it were a virtue, and if she had not had a disposition and a clever little brain, she might have been a very self satisfied young person. But the clever little brain told her a great many sensible and true things about herself and her circumstances, and now and then she talked these things over to Ermengarde as time went on. Things happen to people by accident, she used to say. A lot of nice accidents have happened to me. It just happened that I always liked lessons and books, and could remember things when I learned them. It just happened that I was born with a father who was beautiful and nice and clever, and could give me everything I liked. Perhaps I have not really a good temper at all, but if you have everything you want and everyone is kind to you, how can you help but be good tempered? I don't know, looking quite serious, how I shall ever find out whether I am really a nice child or a horrid one. Perhaps I'm a hideous child, and no one will ever know, just because I never have any trials. Lavinia has no trials, said Ermengarde, stolidly, and she is horrid enough. Sarah rubbed the end of her little nose reflectively, as she thought the matter over. Well, she said at last, perhaps, perhaps that is because Lavinia is growing. This was the result of a charitable recollection of having heard Miss Amelia say that Lavinia was growing so fast that she believed it affected her health and temper. Lavinia, in fact, was spiteful. She was inordinately jealous of Sarah. Until the new pupil's arrival, She had felt herself the leader in the school. She had led because she was capable of making herself extremely disagreeable if the others did not follow her. She domineered over the little children, and assumed grand airs with those big enough to be her companions. She was rather pretty, and had been the best dressed pupil in the procession when the select seminary walked out two by two, until Sarah's velvet coats and sable muffs appeared, combined with drooping ostrich feathers, and were led by Miss Minchin at the head of the line. This, at the beginning, had been bitter enough. But as time went on, it became apparent that Sarah was a leader, too, and not because she could make herself disagreeable, but because she never did. There's one thing about Sarah Crewe, Jessie had enraged her best friend by saying honestly, she's never grand about herself the least bit, and you know she might be, Lavie. I believe I couldn't help being, just a little, if I had so many fine things and was made such a fuss over. It's disgusting, the way Miss Minchin shows her off when parents come. Dear Sarah must come into the drawing room and talk to Mrs. Musgrave about India, mimic Lavinia, in her most highly flavored imitation of Miss Minchin. Dear Sarah must speak French to Lady Pitkin. Her accent is so perfect. She didn't learn her French at the seminary, at any rate. And there's nothing so clever in her knowing it. She says herself she didn't learn it at all. She just picked it up, because she always heard her papa speak it. And, as to her papa, there is nothing so grand in being an Indian officer. Well, said Jessie, slowly, he's killed tigers. He killed the one in the skin Sarah has in her room. That's why she likes it so. She lies on it and strokes its head, and talks to it as if it was a cat. She's always doing something silly, snapped Lavinia. My mama says that way of hers of pretending things is silly. She says she will grow up eccentric. It was quite true that Sarah was never grand. She was a friendly little soul, and shared her privileges and belongings with a free hand. The little ones, who were accustomed to being disdained and ordered out of the way by mature ladies aged ten and twelve, were never made to cry by this most envied of them all. She was a motherly young person, and when people fell down and scraped their knees, she ran and helped them up and patted them, or found in her pocket a bonbon or some other article of a soothing nature. 
she never pushed them out of her way or alluded to their years as a humiliation and a blot upon their small characters. If you are four you are four, she said severely to Lavinia on an occasion of her having, it must be confessed, slapped Lottie and called her a brat, but you will be five next year, and six the year after that. And, opening large, convicting eyes, it takes sixteen years to make you twenty. Dear me, said Lavinia, how we can calculate. In fact, it was not to be denied that sixteen and four made twenty, and twenty was an age the most daring were scarcely bold enough to dream of. So the younger children adored Sarah. More than once she had been known to have a tea party, made up of these despised ones, in her own room. And Emily had been played with, and Emily's own tea service used, the one with cups which held quite a lot of much sweetened weak tea and had blue flowers on them. No one had seen such a very real doll's tea set before. From that afternoon Sarah was regarded as a goddess and a queen by the entire alphabet class. Lottie Lee worshipped her to such an extent that if Sarah had not been a motherly person, she would have found her tiresome. Lottie had been sent to school by a rather flighty young papa who could not imagine what else to do with her. Her young mother had died, and as the child had been treated like a favorite doll or a very spoiled pet monkey or lapdog ever since the first hour of her life, she was a very appalling little creature. When she wanted anything or did not want anything she wept and howled, and, as she always wanted the things she could not have, and did not want the things that were best for her, her shrill little voice was usually to be heard uplifted in wails in one part of the house or another. Her strongest weapon was that in some mysterious way she had found out that a very small girl who had lost her mother was a person who ought to be pitied and made much of. She had probably heard some grown-up people talking her over in the early days, after her mother's death. So it became her habit to make great use of this knowledge. The first time Sarah took her in charge was one morning when, on passing a sitting room, she heard both Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia trying to suppress the angry wails of some child who, evidently, refused to be silenced. She refused so strenuously indeed that Miss Minchin was obliged to almost shout, in a stately and severe manner, to make herself heard. What is she crying for? She almost yelled. Oh, oh. Sarah heard, I haven't got any ma'am, ma a. Eh? Oh, Lottie. Screamed Miss Amelia. Do stop, darling. Don't cry. Please don't. Oh. 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 Lottie howled tempestuously. Haven't got, any, ma'am, ma eh? She ought to be whipped, Miss Minchin proclaimed. You shall be whipped, you naughty child. Lottie wailed more loudly than ever. Miss Amelia began to cry. Miss Minchin's voice rose until it almost thundered, then suddenly she sprang up from her chair in impotent indignation and flounced out of the room, leaving Miss Amelia to arrange the matter. Sarah had paused in the hall, wondering if she ought to go into the room, because she had recently begun a friendly acquaintance with Lottie and might be able to quiet her. When Miss Minchin came out and saw her, she looked rather annoyed. She realized that her voice, as heard from inside the room, could not have sounded either dignified or amiable. Oh, Sarah, she exclaimed, endeavoring to produce a suitable smile. I stopped, explained Sarah, because I knew it was Lottie, and I thought, perhaps, just perhaps, I could make her be quiet. May I try, Miss Minchin? If you can, you are a clever child, answered Miss Minchin, drawing in her mouth sharply. Then, seeing that Sarah looked slightly chilled by her asperity, she changed her manner. But you are clever in everything, she said in her approving way. I dare say you can manage her. Go in. And she left her. When Sarah entered the room, Lottie was lying upon the floor, screaming and kicking her small fat legs violently, and Miss Amelia was bending over her in consternation and despair, looking quite red and damp with heat. Lottie had always found, when in her own nursery at home, that kicking and screaming would always be quieted by any means she insisted on. Poor plump Miss Amelia was trying first one method, and then another. Poor darling, she said one moment, I know you haven't any mama, poor, then in quite another tone, if you don't stop, Lottie, I will shake you. Poor little angel. There. You wicked, bad, detestable child, I will smack you. I will. Sarah went to them quietly. She did not know at all what she was going to do, but she had a vague inward conviction that it would be better not to say such different kinds of things quite so helplessly and excitedly. Miss Amelia, she said in a low voice, Miss Minchin says I may try to make her stop, may I? Miss Amelia turned and looked at her hopelessly. Oh, do you think you can? She gasped. I don't know whether I can, answered Sarah, still in her half-whisper, but I will try. Miss Amelia stumbled up from her knees with a heavy sigh, and Lottie's fat little legs kicked as hard as ever. If you will steal out of the room, said Sarah, I will stay with her. 
Oh, Sarah. Almost whimpered Miss Amelia. We never had such a dreadful child before. I don't believe we can keep her. But she crept out of the room, and was very much relieved to find an excuse for doing it. Sarah stood by the howling furious child for a few moments, and looked down at her without saying anything. Then she sat down flat on the floor beside her and waited. Except for Lottie's angry screams, the room was quite quiet. This was a new state of affairs for little Miss Lee, who was accustomed, when she screamed, to hear other people protest and implore and command and coax by turns. To lie and kick and shriek and find the only person near you not seeming to mind in the least, attracted her attention. She opened her tight shut streaming eyes to see who this person was. And it was only another little girl. But it was the one who owned Emily and all the nice things. And she was looking at her steadily and as if she was merely thinking. Having paused for a few seconds to find this out, Lottie thought she must begin again, but the quiet of the room and of Sarah's odd, interested face made her first howl rather half-hearted. I, haven't, any, ma, 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 eh? She announced, but her voice was not so strong. Sarah looked at her still more steadily, but with a sort of understanding in her eyes. Neither have I, she said. This was so unexpected that it was astounding. Lottie actually dropped her legs, gave a wriggle, and lay and stared. A new idea will stop a crying child when nothing else will. Also it was true that while Lottie disliked Miss Minchin, who was cross, and Miss Amelia, who was foolishly indulgent, she rather liked Sarah, little as she knew her. She did not want to give up her grievance, but her thoughts were distracted from it, so she wriggled again, and, after a sulky sob, said, where is she? Sarah paused a moment. Because she had been told that her mama was in heaven, she had thought a great deal about the matter, and her thoughts had not been quite like those of other people. She went to heaven, she said. But I am sure she comes out sometimes to see me, though I don't see her. So does yours. Perhaps they can both see us now. Perhaps they are both in this room. Lottie sat bolt upright, and looked about her. She was a pretty, little, curly-headed creature, and her round eyes were like wet forget-me-nots. If her mama had seen her during the last half hour, she might not have thought her the kind of child who ought to be related to an angel. Sarah went on talking. Perhaps some people might think that what she said was rather like a fairy story, but it was all so real to her own imagination that Lottie began to listen in spite of herself. She had been told that her mama had wings and a crown, and she had been shown pictures of ladies in beautiful white nightgowns, who were said to be angels. But Sarah seemed to be telling a real story about a lovely country where real people were. There are fields and fields of flowers, she said, forgetting herself, as usual, when she began, and talking rather as if she were in a dream, fields and fields of lilies, and when the soft wind blows over them it wafts the scent of them into the air, and everybody always breathes it, because the soft wind is always blowing. And little children run about in the lily fields and gather armfuls of them, and laugh and make little wreaths. And the streets are shining. And people are never tired, however far they walk. They can float anywhere they like. And there are walls made of pearl and gold all round the city, but they are low enough for the people to go and lean on them, and look down onto the earth and smile, and send beautiful messages. Whatsoever story she had begun to tell, Lottie would, no doubt, have stopped crying, and been fascinated into listening, but there was no denying that this story was prettier than most others. She dragged herself close to Sarah, and drank in every word until the end came, far too soon. When it did come, she was so sorry that she put up her lip ominously. I want to go there, she cried. I, haven't any mama in this school. Sarah saw the danger signal, and came out of her dream. She took hold of the chubby hand and pulled her close to her side with a coaxing little laugh. I will be your mama, she said. We will play that you are my little girl. And Emily shall be your sister. Lottie's dimples all began to show themselves. Shall she? She said. Yes, answered Sarah, jumping to her feet. Let us go and tell her. And then I will wash your face and brush your hair. To which Lottie agreed quite cheerfully, and trotted out of the room and upstairs with her, without seeming even to remember that the whole of the last hour's tragedy had been caused by the fact that she had refused to be washed and brushed for lunch and Miss Minchin had been called in to use her majestic authority. And from that time Sarah was an adopted mother. 5. Becky. Of course the greatest power Sarah possessed and the one which gained her even more followers than her luxuries and the fact that she was the show pupil, the power that Lavinia and certain other girls were most envious of, and at the same time most fascinated by in spite of themselves, was her power of telling stories and of making everything she talked about seem like a story, whether it was one or not. 
Anyone who has been at school with a teller of stories knows what the wonder means, how he or she is followed about and besought in a whisper to relate romances, how groups gather round and hang on the outskirts of the favored party in the hope of being allowed to join in and listen. Sarah not only could tell stories, but she adored telling them. When she sat or stood in the midst of a circle and began to invent wonderful things, her green eyes grew big and shining, her cheeks flushed, and, without knowing that she was doing it, she began to act and made what she told lovely or alarming by the raising or dropping of her voice, the bend and sway of her slim body, and the dramatic movement of her hands. She forgot that she was talking to listening children, she saw and lived with the fairy folk, or the kings and queens and beautiful ladies, whose adventures she was narrating. Sometimes when she had finished her story, she was quite out of breath with excitement, and would lay her hand on her thin, little, quick rising chest, and half laugh as if at herself. When I am telling it, she would say, it doesn't seem as if it was only made up. It seems more real than you are, more real than the schoolroom. I feel as if I were all the people in the story, one after the other. It is queer. She had been at Miss Minchin's school about two years when, one foggy winter's afternoon, as she was getting out of her carriage, comfortably wrapped up in her warmest velvets and furs and looking very much grander than she knew, she caught sight, as she crossed the pavement, of a dingy little figure standing on the area steps, and stretching its neck so that its wide open eyes might peer at her through the railings. Something in the eagerness and timidity of the smudgy face made her look at it, and when she looked she smiled because it was her way to smile at people. But the owner of the smudgy face and the wide open eyes evidently was afraid that she ought not to have been caught looking at pupils of importance. She dodged out of sight like a jack-in-the-box and scurried back into the kitchen, disappearing so suddenly that if she had not been such a poor little forlorn thing, Sarah would have laughed in spite of herself. That very evening, as Sarah was sitting in the midst of a group of listeners in a corner of the schoolroom telling one of her stories, the very same figure timidly entered the room, carrying a coal box much too heavy for her, and knelt down upon the hearth rug to replenish the fire and sweep up the ashes. She was cleaner than she had been when she peeped through the area railings, but she looked just as frightened. She was evidently afraid to look at the children or seemed to be listening. She put on pieces of coal cautiously with her fingers so that she might make no disturbing noise, and she swept about the fire irons very softly. But Sarah saw in two minutes that she was deeply interested in what was going on, and that she was doing her work slowly in the hope of catching a word here and there. And realizing this, she raised her voice and spoke more clearly. The mermaid swam softly about in the crystal green water, and dragged after them a fishing net woven of deep sea pearls, she said. The princess sat on the white rock and watched them. It was a wonderful story about a princess who was loved by a prince merman, and went to live with him in shining caves under the sea. The small drudge before the great swept the hearth once and then swept it again. Having done it twice, she did it three times, and, as she was doing it the third time, the sound of the story so lured her to listen that she fell under the spell and actually forgot that she had no right to listen at all, and also forgot everything else. She sat down upon her heels as she knelt on the hearth rug, and the brush hung idly in her fingers. The voice of the storyteller went on and drew her with it into winding grottoes under the sea, glowing with soft, clear blue light, and paved with pure golden sands. Strange sea flowers and grasses waved about her, and far away faint singing and music echoed. The hearth brush fell from the work roughened hand, and Lavinia Herbert looked round. That girl has been listening, she said. The culprit snatched up her brush, and scrambled to her feet. She caught at the coal box and simply scuttled out of the room like a frightened rabbit. Sarah felt rather hot-tempered. I knew she was listening, she said. Why shouldn't she? Lavinia tossed her head with great elegance. Well, she remarked, I do not know whether your mama would like you to tell stories to servant girls, but I know my mama wouldn't like me to do it. My mama, said Sarah, looking odd. I don't believe she would mind in the least. She knows that stories belong to everybody. I thought, retorted Lavinia, in severe recollection, that your mama was dead. How can she know things? Do you think she doesn't know things? said Sarah, in her stern little voice. Sometimes she had a rather stern little voice. Sarah's mama knows everything, piped in Lottie. So does my mama, sep Sarah is my mama at Miss Minchin's, my other one knows everything. The streets are shining, and there are fields and fields of lilies, and everybody gathers them. Sarah tells me when she puts me to bed. You wicked thing, said Lavinia, turning on Sarah, making fairy stories about heaven. There are much more splendid stories in Revelation, returned Sarah. Just look and see. How do you know mine are fairy stories? But I can tell you with a fine bit of unheavenly temper, you will never find out whether they are or not if you're not kinder to people than you are now. Come along, Lottie. And she marched out of the room, 
rather hoping that she might see the little servant again somewhere, but she found no trace of her when she got into the hall. Who is that little girl who makes the fires? She asked Mariette that night. Mariette broke forth into a flow of description. Ah, indeed, Mademoiselle Sarah might well ask. She was a forlorn little thing who had just taken the place of scullery maid, though, as to being scullery maid, she was everything else besides. She blacked boots and grates, and carried heavy coal scuttles up and down stairs, and scrubbed floors and cleaned windows, and was ordered about by everybody. She was fourteen years old, but was so stunted in growth that she looked about twelve. In truth, Marriott was sorry for her. She was so timid that if one chanced to speak to her it appeared as if her poor, frightened eyes would jump out of her head. What is her name? asked Sarah, who had sat by the table, with her chin on her hands, as she listened absorbedly to the recital. Her name was Becky. Mariette heard everyone below stairs calling, Becky, do this, and Becky, do that, every five minutes in the day. Sarah sat and looked into the fire, reflecting on Becky for some time after Mariette left her. She made up a story of which Becky was the ill-used heroine. She thought she looked as if she had never had quite enough to eat. Her very eyes were hungry. She hoped she should see her again, but though she caught sight of her carrying things up or downstairs on several occasions, she always seemed in such a hurry and so afraid of being seen that it was impossible to speak to her. But a few weeks later, on another foggy afternoon, when she entered her sitting room she found herself confronting a rather pathetic picture. In her own special and pet easy chair before the bright fire, Becky, with a coal smudge on her nose and several on her apron, with her poor little cap hanging half off her head, and an empty coal box on the floor near her, sat fast asleep, tired out beyond even the endurance of her hard-working young body. She had been sent up to put the bedrooms in order for the evening. There were a great many of them, and she had been running about all day. Sarah's room she had saved until the last. They were not like the other rooms, which were plain and bare. Ordinary pupils were expected to be satisfied with mere necessaries. Sarah's comfortable sitting room seemed a bower of luxury to the scullery maid, though it was, in fact, merely a nice, bright little room. But there were pictures and books in it, and curious things from India. There was a sofa in the low, soft chair. Emily sat in a chair of her own, with the air of a presiding goddess, and there was always a glowing fire in a polished grate. Becky saved it until the end of her afternoon's work, because it rested her to go into it, and she always hoped to snatch a few minutes to sit down in the soft chair and look about her, and think about the wonderful good fortune of the child who owned such surroundings and who went out on the cold days in beautiful hats and coats one tried to catch a glimpse of through the area railing. On this afternoon, when she had sat down, the sensation of relief to her short, aching legs had been so wonderful and delightful that it had seemed to soothe her whole body, and the glow of warmth and comfort from the fire had crept over her like a spell, until, as she looked at the red coals, a tired, slow smile stole over her smudged face, her head nodded forward without her being aware of it, her eyes drooped, and she fell fast asleep. She had really been only about ten minutes in the room when Sarah entered, but she was in as deep a sleep as if she had been, like the sleeping beauty, slumbering for a hundred years but she did not look, or Becky, like a sleeping beauty at all. She looked only like an ugly, stunted, worn-out little scullery drudge. Sarah seemed as much unlike her as if she were a creature from another world. On this particular afternoon she had been taking her dancing lesson, and the afternoon on which the dancing master appeared was rather a grand occasion at the seminary, though it occurred every week. The pupils were attired in their prettiest frocks, and as Sarah danced particularly well, she was very much brought forward, and Marriott was requested to make her as diaphanous and fine as possible. Today a frock the color of a rose had been put on her, and Marriott had bought some real buds and made her a wreath to wear on her black locks. She had been learning a new, delightful dance in which she had been skimming and flying about the room, like a large rose-colored butterfly, and the enjoyment and exercise had brought a brilliant, happy glow into her face. When she entered the room, she floated in with a few of the butterfly steps, and there sat Becky, nodding her cap sideways off her head. Oh, cried Sarah, softly, when she saw her. That poor thing. It did not occur to her to feel cross at finding her pet chair occupied by the small, dingy figure. To tell the truth, she was quite glad to find it there. When the ill-used heroine of her story wakened, she could talk to her. She crept toward her quietly, and stood looking at her. Becky gave a little snore. I wish she'd waken herself, Sarah said. I don't like to waken her. But Miss Minchin would be cross if she found out. I'll just wait a few minutes. She took a seat on the edge of the table, and sat swinging her slim, rose-colored legs, and wondering what it would be best to do. Miss Amelia might come in at any moment, and if she did, Becky would be sure to be scolded. 
But she is so tired, she thought. She is so tired. A piece of flaming coal ended her perplexity for her that very moment. It broke off from a large lump and fell onto the fender. Becky started, and opened her eyes with a frightened gasp. She did not know she had fallen asleep. She had only sat down for one moment and felt the beautiful glow, and here she found herself staring in wild alarm at the wonderful pupil, who sat perched quite near her, like a rose-colored fairy, with interested eyes. She sprang up and clutched at her cap. She felt it dangling over her ear, and tried wildly to put it straight. Oh, she had got herself into trouble now with a vengeance. To have impudently fallen asleep on such a young lady's chair. She would be turned out of doors without wages. She made a sound like a big breathless sob. Oh, miss. Oh, miss, she stuttered. I arsed your pardon, miss. Oh, I do, miss. Sarah jumped down, and came quite close to her. Don't be frightened, she said, quite as if she had been speaking to a little girl like herself. It doesn't matter the least bit. I didn't go to do it, miss, protested Becky. It was the warm fire, and me being so tired. It, it was an impertience. Sarah broke into a friendly little laugh, and put her hand on her shoulder. You were tired, she said, you could not help it. You are not really awake yet. How poor Becky stared at her. In fact, she had never heard such a nice, friendly sound in anyone's voice before. She was used to being ordered about and scolded, and having her ears boxed. And this one, in her rose-colored dancing afternoon splendor, was looking at her as if she were not a culprit at all, as if she had a right to be tired, even to fall asleep. The touch of the soft, slim little paw on her shoulder was the most amazing thing she had ever known. Ain't, ain't you angry, miss? She gasped. Ain't you going to tell the missus? No, cried out Sarah. Of course I'm not. The woeful fright in the coal smutted face made her suddenly so sorry that she could scarcely bear it. One of her queer thoughts rushed into her mind. She put her hand against Becky's cheek. Why, she said, we are just the same, I am only a little girl like you. It's just an accident that I am not you, and you are not me. Becky did not understand in the least. Her mind could not grasp such amazing thoughts, and an accident meant to her a calamity in which someone was run over or fell off a ladder and was carried to the hospital. A accident, miss, she fluttered respectfully. Is it? Yes, Sarah answered, and she looked at her dreamily for a moment. But the next she spoke in a different tone. She realized that Becky did not know what she meant. Have you done your work? She asked. Dare you stay here a few minutes? Becky lost her breath again. Here, miss? Me? Sarah ran to the door, opened it and looked out and listened. No one is anywhere about, she explained. If your bedrooms are finished, perhaps you might stay a tiny while. I thought, perhaps, you might like a piece of cake. The next ten minutes seemed to Becky like a sort of delirium. Sarah opened a cupboard, and gave her a thick slice of cake. She seemed to rejoice when it was devoured in hungry bites. She talked and asked questions, and laughed until Becky's fears actually began to calm themselves, and she once or twice gathered boldness enough to ask a question or so herself, daring as she felt it to be. Is that, she ventured, looking longingly at the rose-colored frock. And she asked it almost in a whisper. Is that there your best? It is one of my dancing frocks, answered Sarah. I like it, don't you? For a few seconds Becky was almost speechless with admiration. Then she said in an awed voice, Aunt I see a princess. I was standing in the street with the crowd outside Covent Garden, watching the swells go and tour the opera. And there was one everyone stared at most. They say to each other, that's the princess. She was a grown up young lady, but she was pink all over, gowned and cloak, and flowers and all. I called her to mind the minute I see you, sitting there on the table, miss. You look like her. I've often thought, said Sarah, in her reflecting voice, that I should like to be a princess, I wonder what it feels like. I believe I will begin pretending I am one. Becky stared at her admiringly, and, as before, did not understand her in the least. She watched her with a sort of adoration. Very soon Sarah left her reflections and turned to her with a new question. Becky, she said, weren't you listening to that story? Yes, miss, confessed Becky, a little alarmed again. I know I hadn't heard her, but it was that beautiful eye, I couldn't help it. I liked you to listen to it, said Sarah. If you tell stories, you like nothing so much as to tell them to people who want to listen. I don't know why it is. Would you like to hear the rest? Becky lost her breath again. Me hear it? She cried. Like as if I was a pupil, miss. All about the prince, and the little white mare babies swimming about laughing, with stars in their hair. Sarah nodded. 
you haven't time to hear it now, I'm afraid, she said, but if you will tell me just what time you come to do my rooms, I will try to be here and tell you a bit of it every day until it is finished. It's a lovely long one, and I'm always putting new bits to it. Then, breathed Becky, devoutly, I wouldn't mind how heavy the coal boxes was, or what the cook done to me, if, if I might have that to think of. You may, said Sarah. I'll tell it all to you. When Becky went downstairs, she was not the same Becky who had staggered up, loaded down by the weight of the coal scuttle. She had an extra piece of cake in her pocket, and she had been fed and warmed, but not only by cake and fire. Something else had warmed and fed her, and the something else was Sarah. When she was gone Sarah sat on her favorite perch on the end of her table. Her feet were on a chair, her elbows on her knees, and her chin in her hands. If I was a princess, a real princess, she murmured, I could scatter largesse to the populace. But even if I am only a pretend princess, I can invent little things to do for people. Things like this. She was just as happy as if it was largesse. I'll pretend that to do things people like is scattering largesse. I've scattered largesse. 6. The Diamond Mines. Not very long after this a very exciting thing happened. Not only Sarah, but the entire school, found it exciting, and made it the chief subject of conversation for weeks after it occurred. In one of his letters Captain Crewe told a most interesting story. A friend who had been at school with him when he was a boy had unexpectedly come to see him in India. He was the owner of a large tract of land upon which diamonds had been found, and he was engaged in developing the mines. If all went as was confidently expected, he would become possessed of such wealth as it made one dizzy to think of, and because he was fond of the friend of his school days, he had given him an opportunity to share in this enormous fortune by becoming a partner in his scheme. This, at least, was what Sarah gathered from his letters. It is true that any other business scheme, however magnificent, would have had but small attraction for her or for the schoolroom, but diamond mines sounded so like the Arabian Nights that no one could be indifferent. Sarah thought them enchanting, and painted pictures, for Ermengarde and Lottie, of labyrinth and passages in the bowels of the earth, where sparkling stones studded the walls and roofs and ceilings, and strange, dark men dug them out with heavy picks. Ermengarde delighted in the story, and Lottie insisted on its being retold to her every evening. Lavinia was very spiteful about it, and told Jesse that she didn't believe such things as diamond mines existed. My mama has a diamond ring which cost 40 pounds, she said. And it is not a big one, either. If there were mines full of diamonds, people would be so rich it would be ridiculous. Perhaps Sarah will be so rich that she will be ridiculous, giggled Jessie. She's ridiculous without being rich, Lavinia sniffed. I believe you hate her, said Jessie. No, I don't, snapped Lavinia. But I don't believe in mines full of diamonds. Well, people have to get them from somewhere, said Jessie. Lavinia, with a new giggle, what do you think Gertrude says? I don't know, I'm sure, and I don't care if it's something more about that everlasting Sarah. Well, it is. One of her pretends is that she is a princess. She plays it all the time, even in school. She says it makes her learn her lessons better. She wants Ermengarde to be one, two, but Ermengarde says she is too fat. She is too fat, said Lavinia. And Sarah is too thin. Naturally, Jessie giggled again. She says it has nothing to do with what you look like, or what you have. It has only to do with what you think of, and what you do. I suppose she thinks she could be a princess if she was a beggar, said Lavinia. Let us begin to call her your royal highness. Lessons for the day were over, and they were sitting before the schoolroom fire, enjoying the time they liked best. It was the time when Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia were taking their tea in the sitting room sacred to themselves. At this hour a great deal of talking was done, and a great many secrets changed hands, particularly if the younger pupils behaved themselves well, and did not squabble or run about noisily, which it must be confessed they usually did. When they made an uproar the older girls usually interfered with scolding and shakes. They were expected to keep order, and there was danger that if they did not, Miss Minchin or Miss Amelia would appear and put an end to festivities. Even as Lavinia spoke the door opened and Sarah entered with Lottie, whose habit was to trot everywhere after her like a little dog. There she is, with that horrid child, exclaimed Lavinia in a whisper. If she's so fond of her, why doesn't she keep her in her own room? She will begin howling about something in five minutes. It happened that Lottie had been seized with a sudden desire to play in the schoolroom, and had begged her adopted parent to come with her. She joined a group of little ones who were playing in a corner. Sarah curled herself up in the window seat, opened a book, and began to read. It was a book about the French Revolution, and she was soon lost in a harrowing picture of the prisoners in the Bastille, men who had spent so many years in dungeons that when they were dragged out by those who rescued them, 
their long, grey hair and beards almost hid their faces, and they had forgotten that an outside world existed at all, and were like beings in a dream. She was so far away from the schoolroom that it was not agreeable to be dragged back suddenly by a howl from Lottie. Never did she find anything so difficult as to keep herself from losing her temper when she was suddenly disturbed while absorbed in a book. People who are fond of books know the feeling of irritation which sweeps over them at such a moment. The temptation to be unreasonable and snappish is one not easy to manage. It makes me feel as if someone had hit me, Sarah had told Ermengarde once in confidence. And as if I want to hit back. I have to remember things quickly to keep from saying something ill-tempered. She had to remember things quickly when she laid her book on the window seat and jumped down from her comfortable corner. Lottie had been sliding across the schoolroom floor, and, having first irritated Lavinia and Jessie by making a noise, had ended by falling down and hurting her fat knee. She was screaming and dancing up and down in the midst of a group of friends and enemies, who were alternately coaxing and scolding her. Stop this minute, you crybaby. Stop this minute, Lavinia commanded. I'm not a crybaby, I'm not. Wailed Lottie. Sarah, sa, ra. If she doesn't stop, Miss Minchin will hear her, cried Jessie. Lottie darling, I'll give you a penny. I don't want your penny, sobbed Lottie, and she looked down at the fat knee, and, seeing a drop of blood on it, burst forth again. Sarah flew across the room and, kneeling down, put her arms round her. Now, Lottie, she said. Now, Lottie, you promised Sarah. She said I was a crybaby, wept Lottie. Sarah patted her, but spoke in the steady voice Lottie knew. But if you cry, you will be one, Lottie pet. You promised, Lottie remembered that she had promised, but she preferred to lift up her voice. I haven't any mama, she proclaimed. I haven't, a bit, of mama. Yes, you have, said Sarah, cheerfully. Have you forgotten? Don't you know that Sarah is your mama? Don't you want Sarah for your mama? Lottie cuddled up to her with a consoled sniff. Come and sit in the window seat with me, Sarah went on, and I'll whisper a story to you. Will you? whimpered Lottie. Will you, tell me, about the diamond mines? The diamond mines? broke out Lavinia. Nasty, little spoiled thing, I should like to slap her. Sarah got up quickly on her feet. It must be remembered that she had been very deeply absorbed in the book about the Bastille, and she had had to recall several things rapidly when she realized that she must go and take care of her adopted child. She was not an angel, and she was not fond of Lavinia. Well, she said, with some fire, I should like to slap you, but I don't want to slap you. Restraining herself. At least I both want to slap you, and I should like to slap you, but I won't slap you. We are not little gutter children. We are both old enough to know better. Here was Lavinia's opportunity. Ah, yes, your royal highness, she said. We are princesses, I believe. At least one of us is. The school ought to be very fashionable now Miss Minchin has a princess for a pupil. Sarah started toward her. She looked as if she were going to box her ears. Perhaps she was. Her trick of pretending things was the joy of her life. She never spoke of it to girls she was not fond of. Her new pretend about being a princess was very near to her heart, and she was shy and sensitive about it. She had meant it to be rather a secret, and here was Lavinia deriding it before nearly all the school. She felt the blood rush up into her face and tingle in her ears. She only just saved herself. If you were a princess, you did not fly into rages. Her hand dropped, and she stood quite still a moment. When she spoke it was in a quiet, steady voice, she held her head up, and everybody listened to her. It's true, she said. Sometimes I do pretend I am a princess. I pretend I am a princess, so that I can try and behave like one. Lavinia could not think of exactly the right thing to say. Several times she had found that she could not think of a satisfactory reply when she was dealing with Sarah. The reason for this was that, somehow, the rest always seemed to be vaguely in sympathy with her opponent. She saw now that they were pricking up their ears interestedly. The truth was, they liked princesses, and they all hoped they might hear something more definite about this one, and drew nearer Sarah accordingly. Lavinia could only invent one remark, and it fell rather flat. Dear me, she said, I hope, when you ascend the throne, you won't forget us. I won't, said Sarah, and she did not utter another word, but stood quite still, and stared at her steadily as she saw her take Jessie's arm and turn away. After this, the girls who were jealous of her used to speak of her as Princess Sarah whenever they wished to be particularly disdainful, and those who were fond of her gave her the name among themselves as a term of affection. No one called her Princess instead of Sarah, but her adorers were much pleased with the picturesqueness and grandeur of the title, and Miss Minchin, hearing of it, 
mentioned it more than once to visiting parents, feeling that it rather suggested a sort of royal boarding school. To Becky it seemed the most appropriate thing in the world. The acquaintance begun on the foggy afternoon when she had jumped up terrified from her sleep in the comfortable chair, had ripened and grown, though it must be confessed that Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia knew very little about it. They were aware that Sarah was kind to the scullery maid, but they knew nothing of certain delightful moments snatched perilously when, the upstairs rooms being set in order with lightning rapidity, Sarah's sitting room was reached, and the heavy coal box set down with a sigh of joy. At such time stories were told by installments, things of a satisfying nature were either produced and eaten or hastily tucked into pockets to be disposed of at night, when Becky went upstairs to her attic to bed. But I has to eat em careful, miss, she said once, cause if I leaves crumbs the rats come out to get em. Rats, exclaimed Sarah, in horror. Are there rats there? Lots of em, miss, Becky answered in quite a matter-of-fact manner. There mostly is rats and mice in attics. You gets used to the noise they make scuttling about. I've got so I don't mind em as long as they don't run over my pillar. Uck, said Sarah. You gets used to anything after a bit, said Becky. You have to, miss, if you're born a scullery maid. I'd rather have rats than cockroaches. So would I, said Sarah, I suppose you might make friends with a rat in time, but I don't believe I should like to make friends with a cockroach. Sometimes Becky did not dare to spend more than a few minutes in the bright, warm room, and when this was the case perhaps only a few words could be exchanged, and a small purchase slipped into the old-fashioned pocket Becky carried under her dress skirt, tied round her waist with a band of tape. The search for and discovery of satisfying things to eat which could be packed into small compass, added a new interest to Sarah's existence. When she drove or walked out, she used to look into shop windows eagerly. The first time it occurred to her to bring home two or three little meat pies, she felt that she had hit upon a discovery. When she exhibited them, Becky's eyes quite sparkled. Oh, miss, she murmured. Then we'll be nice and fill in. It's fill in that's best. Sponge cake's a evenly thing, but it melts away like, if you understand, miss. These'll just stay in your stomach. Well, hesitated Sarah, I don't think it would be good if they stayed always, but I do believe they will be satisfying. They were satisfying, and so were beef sandwiches, bought at a cook shop, and so were rolls and bologna sausage. In time, Becky began to lose her hungry, tired feeling, and the coal box did not seem so unbearably heavy. However heavy it was, and whatsoever the temper of the cook, and the hardness of the work heaped upon her shoulders, she had always the chance of the afternoon to look forward to, the chance that Miss Sarah would be able to be in her sitting room. In fact, the mere seeing of Miss Sarah would have been enough without meat pies. If there was time only for a few words, they were always friendly, merry words that put heart into one, and if there was time for more, then there was an installment of a story to be told, or some other thing one remembered afterward and sometimes lay awake in one's bed in the attic to think over. Sarah, who was only doing what she unconsciously liked better than anything else, nature having made her for a giver, had not the least idea what she meant to poor Becky, and how wonderful a benefactor she seemed. If nature has made you for a giver, your hands are born open, and so is your heart, and though there may be times when your hands are empty, your heart is always full, and you can give things out of that, warm things, kind things, sweet things, help and comfort and laughter, and sometimes gay, kind laughter is the best help of all. Becky had scarcely known what laughter was through all her poor, little hard-driven life. Sarah made her laugh, and laughed with her, and, though neither of them quite knew it, the laughter was as fill-in as the meat pies. A few weeks before Sarah's eleventh birthday a letter came to her from her father, which did not seem to be written in such boyish high spirits as usual. He was not very well, and was evidently overweighted by the business connected with the diamond mines. You see, little Sarah, he wrote, your daddy is not a businessman at all, and figures and documents bother him. He does not really understand them, and all this seems so enormous. Perhaps, if I was not feverish I should not be awake, tossing about, one half of the night and spend the other half in troublesome dreams. If my little missus were here, I dare say she would give me some solemn, good advice. You would, wouldn't you, little missus? One of his many jokes had been to call her his little missus because she had such an old-fashioned air. He had made wonderful preparations for her birthday. Among other things, a new doll had been ordered in Paris, and her wardrobe was to be, indeed, a marvel of splendid perfection. When she had replied to the letter asking her if the doll would be an acceptable present, Sarah had been very quaint. I am getting very old, she wrote, you see, I shall never live to have another doll given me. This will be my last doll. There is something solemn about it. If I could write poetry, I am sure a poem about a last doll would be very nice. But I cannot write poetry. 
I have tried, and it made me laugh. It did not sound like Watts or Coleridge or Shakespeare at all. No one could ever take Emily's place, but I should respect the last doll very much, and I am sure the school would love it. They all like dolls, though some of the big ones, the almost fifteen ones, pretend they are too grown up. Captain Crewe had a splitting headache when he read this letter in his bungalow in India. The table before him was heaped with papers and letters which were alarming him and filling him with anxious dread, but he laughed as he had not laughed for weeks. Oh, he said, she's better fun every year she lives. God grant this business may right itself and leave me free to run home and see her. What wouldn't I give to have her little arms round my neck this minute? What wouldn't I give? The birthday was to be celebrated by great festivities. The schoolroom was to be decorated, and there was to be a party. The boxes containing the presents were to be opened with great ceremony, and there was to be a glittering feast spread in Miss Minchin's sacred room. When the day arrived the whole house was in a whirl of excitement. How the morning passed nobody quite knew, because there seemed such preparations to be made. The schoolroom was being decked with garlands of holly, the desks had been moved away, and red covers had been put on the forms which were arrayed round the room against the wall. When Sarah went into her sitting room in the morning, she found on the table a small, dumpy package, tied up in a piece of brown paper. She knew it was a present, and she thought she could guess whom it came from. She opened it quite tenderly. It was a square pin cushion, made of not quite clean red flannel, and black pins had been stuck carefully into it to form the words, many happy returns. Oh, cried Sarah, with a warm feeling in her heart. What pain she has taken. I like it so, it, it makes me feel sorrowful. But the next moment she was mystified. On the underside of the pincushion was secured a card, bearing in neat letters the name Miss Amelia Minchin. Sarah turned it over and over. Miss Amelia, she said to herself how can it be? And just at that very moment she heard the door being cautiously pushed open and saw Becky peeping round it. There was an affectionate, happy grin on her face, and she shuffled forward and stood nervously pulling at her fingers. Do you like it, Miss Sarah? She said. Do you? Like it? Cried Sarah. You darling Becky, you made it all yourself. Becky gave a hysteric but joyful sniff, and her eyes looked quite moist with delight. It ain't nothing but flannin, and the flannin ain't new, but I wanted to give yer something and I made it of nights. I knew yer could pretend it was satin with diamond pins in. Underscore I underscore tried to when I was making it. The card, miss, rather doubtfully, T weren't wrong of me to pick it up out of the dustbin, was it? Miss Melior had thrown it away. I had no card of my own, and I knowed it wouldn't be a proper precinct if I didn't pin a card on, so I pinned Miss Meliers. Sarah flew at her and hugged her. She could not have told herself or anyone else why there was a lump in her throat. Oh, Becky, she cried out, with a queer little laugh, I love you, Becky, I do, I do. Oh, miss. Breathed Becky. Thank yer, miss, kindly, it ain't good enough for that. The, the flannin wasn't new. 英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロード、その他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com 88thpp.com